We are now ready to go into the last uh, section of module 12 uh, where we look at um, doing hypothesis tests when our standard deviation of the population is unknown. And in this section we're going to be assuming some slightly different things from the previous. Uh, most of these are the same. We're going to have a good uh, random sample we're going to assume that the population is approximately normal and that the population sigma is not known and so we are forced to estimate the standard deviation of the population with our s value which of course is the standard deviation of our sample in this case we're using the t value as our test statistic but basically the formula remains the same uh, s is used instead of sigma and that's really the only difference here we're also calling it a T now to identify our critical value um, this is where we would need to either use your technology um, or we would use uh, the table that we you've been provided and uh, we need to determine this using the degrees of freedom since we're going to be using the T chart uh, by subtracting one from our sample size Critical values, of course, are very important when you're using a critical value approach in that they represent the boundaries between the rejection and the failing to reject regions. And remember also that uh, what type of test we're running depends on the, that, or the inequality symbol that we have in our alternative hypothesis. It's a less than symbol. We're doing a left tail test greater than symbol it's a right tail test and a not equal to symbol this is a two tail test and in the critical value approach our conclusion rule is that we're going to reject the null hypothesis if our test statistic falls within the rejection region in other words it gets beyond my boundary value so for a left tail test we would see uh, a negative t value on the left remember that if it's uh, a value that's less than your mean. Uh, the, the t chart is only going to give you positive t values, so you want to substitute those in. But this is our critical value. This is our boundary value uh, that we need to get beyond in order to consider our sample result uh, highly unlikely uh, and falling in the rejection region. And the rejection region is to the left of it failing to reject region will be to the right of it and the area of my tail here is going to be equal to whatever my alpha value is. So the basic idea is if my null is true then my value should fall over here somewhere and if it doesn't if it falls into the extreme area of the curve then we must assume that the null hypothesis is false therefore we reject it in favor of the alternative. For a two-tailed test, we've got, or a right-tailed test, excuse me, uh, we have the rejection region on the right and the failing to reject region to its left. Alpha is right there. This represents my critical value. And then for a two-tailed test, we're actually going to have two critical values. We're splitting up our tail area in two, so that's why we have this alpha over two, alpha over two. And we have two T values as boundaries representing our rejection regions and then our failing to reject region is in the middle. So just a quick sample. Um, determine the rejection region and the critical values for the following hypothesis tests. We're going to start with this one. We're going to assume our alpha is 0 0.05, so that's our significance level. Our degrees of freedom are 18, and it's a left-tailed test. Uh, question is, what is the critical value that separates my rejection region from the failing to reject region? Keeping in mind that the area of the rejection region is always equal to your alpha, your significance level. And in this case, it's at 0 0.025. See if you can determine... Uh, the T value for this. So on your T chart you would want to look up uh, one sided P uh, and look for that area which is 0 0.025 uh, 
I'm going to go up to 18 degrees of freedom. And because this is a left tailed test, our test statistic value is negative 2.101. Uh, so that's our critical value, separating our rejection from the failing to reject region. And we're going to see if we can get beyond that. Uh, what would the conclusion be then if your test statistic had a value of negative 1.92? Well, negative 1.92 is right about there. Doesn't quite make it into the rejection region. And so in this case, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis, whatever it is. Remember that the critical value represents the tipping point between where we uh, determine sample results to be extreme or if they're uh, closer to zero there, we consider them to be not extreme enough. In this case, we got really close, but our sample value just wasn't extreme enough for us to reject the null hypothesis. Now for the next few problems, I want you to draw a picture representing things and, and use uh, your pause button here. So given an alpha of 0 0.05, my sample size to be 20, and my test statistic result to be 1.87. So this is from my sample. Determine first what the critical value is in this case. Hit pause for a minute while you figure that out. The result ends up being uh, my critical value is 1.729. So looking at the picture you've drawn, the question is, does your test statistic warrant rejection of the null hypothesis? The conclusion here is, yes, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. If you look at your picture, uh, 1.87 fell into my rejection region because my critical value, the one I needed to get past, was 1.729. Here's the next test. See if you can determine what the critical values would be for this, given the alpha level of 0 0.10 and my n being equal to 29, and the fact that it's a two-tailed test. So the critical value of this case is positive and negative 1.701. Uh, so drawing a picture of that and then seeing where your test statistic lands in comparison to that, our conclusion here would be to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Negative 1.60 is not extremely enough to the left to get into the rejection region, so you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Our final example, uh, 0.01 n equal to 19, and our test statistic is negative 3.01. Determine the critical value in this case, or the critical value since this is a two-tailed test. The critical values, if you look on your T-chart, should be 2.878. Uh, there's 18 degrees of freedom. You'll notice that your degrees of freedom is always one less than n in all these cases. And our test statistic in that case falls into the rejection region, so we reject the null hypothesis. So here's an uh, example we're going to go through and, and test this. Uh, manufacturers responsible for making barrels to store crude oil for the United States, which federal requirement state must hold 42 gallons of oil. As part of his routine quality check, you randomly select 27 gallons off the assembly line and find that their mean capacity is 41.7 with a standard deviation of 0.8. Uh, so notice that's a sample standard deviation. Can you as a quality control administrator say with 99% confidence that the requirements are being met, assume a population distribution is approximately normal? All right, so for this, um, our mean is what is expected. We assume we have a 42 uh, gallons of oil capacity in our barrels, um, unless we can prove otherwise. And so our mu is, is 42. 
and uh, the way it's worded, it just says uh, that the requirements are being met. Uh, so if they weren't being met, they'd either be greater than 42 or less than 42. Therefore, they don't really give us a direction. And we therefore say that mu is not equal to 42 for our alternative hypothesis. All right, being that this is a two-tailed test, then we determine what our critical values are uh, for this test. And uh, 0 0.005, 0 0.005 is we're splitting up that 1%, which is the uh, significance level, right? Uh, with a 99% confidence, that's a 1% significance level two tail test, so we split up that extra remaining 1% into both tails, 0 0.005. And our critical values for this then end up being what? And if you said positive and negative 2.779, you are correct. That would be our critical values in this test. And so we run our test. Um, it appears, at least from the outset, that we're a little bit lower than 42 uh, gallons of oil on average, but that's simply based on our sample data. We want to see if that's significant, an, a significant enough difference for us to reject the null. Uh, so we compare that result with the assumed 42, etc. We divide, uh, we get negative 1.949 which is to the left, and we're almost two standard deviations, but we need to be almost three standard deviations to reject our null. So we didn't quite make it uh, with the criteria we set up in this case. So we had negative 1.949. And so in this case, we do not have enough evidence. We fail to reject the null based on the sample, the manufacturer can be 99% confident that the barrels are falling within the necessary standards. All right, we're failing to reject the null, so we're actually saying that, yep, it looks like these barrels are meeting the requirements because we're not going to reject this and assume that they are different than 42, kind of our worst case uh, scenario here. Here's another example, and here's one where uh, we're actually given data that we need to uh, calculate. Sarah, a university junior, chose to live on the honors floor of her dorm because she was told that the girls on the floor would be quiet and studious. In fact, Sarah was told that students on the honors floor study at least 11 hours per week. After living on the honors floor for a few months, Sarah is convinced that the students around her study less than 11 hours per week. To test her claim, Sarah polls 10 girls on the floor, test Sarah's claim, given the results below at the 0 0.10 level of significance. Notice that even with very few data, we can run a test. Uh, here she's only talked to 10 girls, but we're running a t-test, uh, which gives us some room for error. And that's what's great about the t. So in this case, uh, this should say mu is equal to 11, not greater than or equal to, but equal to, because mu is always going to be equal. Um, I put this there. In some books, uh, they always go with the description for your null. And here they said at least 11 hours per week. But really, we're just testing to see uh, whether they're less than. So we don't really care that it's greater than or equal to in our null. Uh, we just want to see if it's less than 11 hours per week. That would represent a sizable difference which is what Sarah's claim is. She's convinced that the students study less than 11 hours per week. All right, so we would need to put this into our calculator. Notice that you're not given a standard deviation, and that's because we don't need it. We can use these data values here to find the standard deviation. If we go to stat, uh, edit, put in these lists of numbers into one of my lists, and then go stat calc, choice number one. Go ahead and do that right now. Hit pause on the video and figure out what the mean is of these 10 girls and then what the standard deviation S is of this sample. We're using S because this is sample data and so that's the more appropriate number to use. Alright and uh, 
for the significance level of 0 0.10. For a one-tailed test, we do one because we're doing less than, you would see that the critical value is negative 1.383 at uh, nine degrees of freedom. Now we run our test to see how our sample data compares. You should get 9.5 as the average of these hours spent studying here, which does appear to be less than 11, but is it significantly less than 11 is the question. And negative 1.58 is the result of that, is what you should get, which means it falls over here. This means that this uh, sample she collected was extreme enough. It was beyond the level of significance we set in this case, and so our conclusion is to reject the null hypothesis. It appears that there is enough evidence to suggest that the girls on her floor indeed study less than 11 hours per week. So again, we have uh, stated the rejection or the failing to reject of the null hypothesis, and also uh, we say what the evidence suggests. We would say there's enough evidence or sufficient evidence to suggest that the girls on her floor indeed study less than 11 hours per week. This concludes our video for this session. Uh, there are some more examples if you want to look through them in the PowerPoints. Uh, you can run these just as I'm doing here and kind of work through them on your own. I hope this helps bring some conclusion uh, to Chapter 12.